Well, shall we start off in the room where it all starts? This is the mill room where we keep the malt and crack it. Right. Just squeeze in here. Well, tomorrow, for instance, we're making another batch of Doris. And so later on today, I shall take four bags or so of this pale malt and put it through the mill so that it comes out in a cracked form, which is like this. Just the grains broken open. Do you, do you know what the malting process is all about? <coughs> well, perhaps I should just go over that sort of briefly. If you take um, freshly reaped barley, uh, <coughs> it, it looks very much like the stuff that we put through the mill. Open one of these bags. doesn't look much drift different from the way it looked when it came off the, uh, the stall. Uh, but <coughs> uh, what's happened is that it's been malted, that is to say it's been steeped in water so that it started to grow. And when the shoots got to about an inch and a half long, then a temperature was raised and they were shuffled about so that all the shoots fell off. And the point of this is that when uh, barley grows, it produces in the, in the grain an enzyme which has the power to convert the starch, which most of the grains are made up of, into sugar, if the conditions are right. So it's this you know, strange kind of characteristic of the process of growth in barley. So <coughs> we, it's, it's steeped, I and mean, we don't do this, we buy it when it's been all done. But it's steeped, it grows a bit, then the temperature's raised, and what you get at that point is this, which is pale ale malt. Now if you go on raising the temperature a little further, and a little further and a little further, and at each stage you get a different sort of malt, which has other characteristics. This is rich in starch and therefore potentially in sugar, so it will produce a lot of alcohol. If you go further up the scale, <coughs> maybe to more or less the top level of roasting, um, then you get stuff called chocolate malt, which uh, produces less alcohol potentially, because there's less uh, starch left to be converted into sugar, uh, but it does produce a lot of flavour. So <clears throat> that's the uh, that's the beginning of the process. Let's say we buy it when it's been malted. We crack it just to expose the little bits of starch, and then we set up the conditions to convert that starch into sugar. And that process goes on across the hall in the uh, the brew house. Uh, and that's the mashing process. So if you'd like to move across there, that's where it would have been heating overnight, uh, into this tank, which is the mash tun. Um, and then we shall mix with it the grain that we've cracked, uh, which I shall be cracking this evening. We make sort of thick porridge stuff, which uh, comes up to about here. And we adjust the temperature so that it's 155 uh, Fahrenheit, <coughs> and then put a lid on and insulate it and leave it for a couple of hours. And that sets up the conditions for all the starch in the grain to be converted into sugar. And of course, once it's been converted to sugar, then it's available for fermentation. So at the end of the two hours or so, <coughs> we check to see if all the starch has been converted. And if it has, then we gently run it out and pump it through into the copper, leaving all the spent grains behind here on top of the false bottom. And once it's in the copper, then we bring it up to a boil, and put the hops in, and let it boil for couple of hours, and at the end of that time we pump it through a cooler upstairs for the fermenter, and when the temperature is down low enough then we put the yeast in and leave it until its gravity has come down to the level we want. So that's basically the process. I mean, we'll go upstairs and have a look at the fermenters. Is there anything that needs uh, any further explanation? Is it usually in the, uh, this one here? Well, we work on two hours, so we check it after two hours. And and if, if how do you check it? What is it that you do? Uh, <coughs> we take a sample out on, on a plate, and it's just an ordinary plate, and drop a little iodine into it. And if it's full of starch, then the iodine simply goes blue-black. But if the starch has been converted to sugar, 
then the ion beam simply dissipates as a little brown, sort of series of brown specks, really. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that tells us that the conversion is taking place. And then it's over there. Yes. If it hasn't converted, then we usually give it a bit longer, and that generally is the trick. And as I say, we run it out as gently as we can, so as to leave this pretty well undisturbed, and then pump it through into the copper. Can you overdo it so to do it wrong? Or? Like I do. Yeah, well, you can. You can get the temperature off. That's the most likely thing to happen. If it's too hot, one thing happens. If you get it too cold, something else happens. But there is a bit of a band at which you can get reasonable results. There you go. That's <coughs> old carrick. That's old carrick. Yeah. In a few days, after doing pudding casks. Uh, but they're better if they're left for a few weeks, really. How long do you say start to finish? Uh, well, the preparation takes just a few hours, and the following day, the brewing takes a full day, and then it will be in the fermenter anything from two to four days, depending on the beer and the conditions. Um, this one will have been in four days when we wreck it tomorrow. But of course, being old Carrick, it's got, there's more work for the yeast to do, because it's a strong beer. We start at a, at a specific gravity of 1060 with this one, and we want to rack it at about 1015, 1014 uh, into casks. So it's had quite, quite a long way to fall, 45 points of gravity on thereabouts. So it's about to take a reasonably long time for that to happen. Uh, the old carrot, the, I'm sorry, the Doris uh, over there ought really only to take a couple of days, maybe three. And it's all, all the fermenting is done so that aerobically with oxygen in contact with it. As yes, as it, it is. As well as when you do yes. in, in damage on, so it's all mm. up to the air. Mm. So. Yeah. Yes, at the beginning it does need oxygen, and so when we put the yeast in, we give it a good uh, rousing to get some air into it. Um, a lot of various ways of doing that, but that's the way we do it. We just stir it up with a big spoon, effectively. Um, but after that, after the first flush of the fermentation is over, then it's anaerobic, and so it carries on even though there's a good layer of carbon dioxide on top. I don't know if you noticed, but if you leaned over here, <coughs> it, it tends to take your breath away. That's the carbon dioxide coming on. That's, that's, um, <coughs> you know, fall in and you can't get out because you're overcome by the fumes of safety. <laughs> <laughs> We've never found any pigeons in so far, but they do have that problem in some areas. And that's why. It's not a strong one. No. It's, uh, it's an old, ordinary sort of session beer. Really, isn't it? Do you only want a small one? Right. To keep the fermenter cool. So this is the prototype that you can see in there. Why bother making Why bother? Well, <coughs> I suppose because of the challenge, really. Uh, it's not very easy making a log because of this business of having to keep the temperature pretty low. Um, not many people are making real lager, so we thought we might perhaps have a go at it. But we've got a malt, and we've got the hops, and we've got the yeast, and we just haven't got the coolers. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, uh, we're getting there. Got the guinea pigs now. Uh, plenty of guinea pigs now, yeah. <laughs> The easiest thing is to find people to taste it. <laughs> An extra neighbour was having a go at trying to make homemade wine. So oh, yeah. He had the same challenge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd yeah. like to try this one. <laughs> Why did you uh, try to make your own ale or whatever? Why? Yeah. <clears throat> that was. Um, we thought we'd like to be our own boss, uh, bosses to begin with. That's, I think that's the first thing. <coughs> have some sort of business. 
not have to you know, be able to make our own decisions, even if they turn out to be stupid ones, rather than having to work for somebody else and appeal to them. Well, you get a good idea and you say, oh, we ought to do this. The boss says no. Mm -hmm. There's always this soggy hand of authority. So <clears throat> we thought we'd like to be independent. And then it was a matter of um, just thinking, well, what are we going to do? Be a green dresser? No. Get up too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> what else? Well, I like drinking beer, so how about making? So that's what we did. So how long have you been making? Just over three years. Still novices, really. We're learning all the time. And we both aren't yet He's going to buy you out. <laughs> no, we've refused all the bids, so. <laughs> I think we've got a long way to go before anybody gets that interested. <laughs> we need to find a few more outlets <clears throat> and begin to develop a little more. But, uh, we're working well under capacity, really. We're producing, I suppose, about <clears throat> seven or eight barrels a week, which is not really. We could produce twice that without much difficulty. <coughs>